Welcome back, everybody. And uh, for today's, today's plan is actually to go through some of the mathematics which we started to look at uh, yesterday. And we are going to dive into more details about the interpretations of these methods. And we're also going to look at uh, the next topic, which is a change from ordinary least squares to something which is called lasso regression and rich regression. And these are two uh, widely used methods, and they're going to lay the foundation for additional fitting parameters. And many of these methods, which uh, are linked with uh, like ridge regression and lasso regression, which bring in these additional parameters, which are called hyperparameters or regularization parameters, they can allow us some more flexibility in fitting uh, a model to the data. So lasso and ridge regression are going to serve as an entry point for types of regularization of the model, which gives us more flexibility in fitting. More flexibility means more parameters, and that's going to increase the parameter space. And we are going to meet these uh, type of uh, regularization terms in uh, studies of neural networks, logistic regression, basically any of the machine learning methods which we will cover here. Uh, quickly reminder, uh, the uh, videos of the lectures are uploaded uh, right after the lecture, so in case you had no possibility to be here, you can always look at the lecture. It takes some time to get the subtitles, so this is uh, a feature offered by YouTube, and it takes normally, when you have two hours of lectures, it takes typically 10 to 20 hours before they generate the subtitles. So if you can live without the subtitles, I mean, you should have the videos right after the lectures, and you get the links here. And you also find the links on the regular schedule, and you will also find the link under the Jupyter book with the schedule uh, for the uh, uh, weekly plans. So today, we are going to take a closer look at uh, some mathematical interpretations of linear regression. Uh, we're also going to bring up again some of the statistical interpretations which we did yesterday. And then we're going to dive into linear regression with ridge and lasso. And we need to go through an algorithm which is called singular value decomposition. And the reason for that is because the matrix we want to invert when we do ordinary least squares may not be invertible. So the singular value decomposition is, to me, is actually the most beautiful algorithm in linear algebra. It allows you to do basically everything with matrices, eigenvalue problems, matrix inversions, and so on. So if you've never met it, now it's time to really start looking at it. Normally in a linear algebra course, they tend to scratch the surface of the singular value decomposition or just the SVD. So, uh, but it depends on the teachers. So how many of you have heard of the singular value decomposition theorem? Well, it's a good fraction of you. So this is uh, what saves the day if we are going to invert a matrix which may not be invertible. Okay, so I'm going to use mainly uh, the whiteboard today to a large extent. I'm not going to run many examples because I actually wanted to slow down the pace a little bit. I may change sometimes between the whiteboard and and the slides. So let me just switch to the whiteboard here and then we move on. So let's uh, uh, start with what we had for linear regression, ordinary least squares. So I'm going to use this acronym OLS for ordinary least squares. So that's going to be ordinary least squares the equation which we have derived. So I'm just gonna remind you in the beginning of some of the basic features which we have been discussing. So what we did is to assume that we have some output data which can be described in terms of a mathematical function, a continuous function which exists. 
plus some normal distributed noise. This is the basic assumption about the data. So f of x is seen as, in general, a deterministic function, a well-defined function. So there is normally uh, no stochasticity connected with f of x. It could be. It could happen that the x's could be described by a probability distribution. We are assuming that this epsilon f is now given by a normal distribution with zero mean, and normally we put a variance equal to one, but I'm simply going to put a variance sigma squared here, and I'm going to put a subscript epsilon to indicate that that variance uh, is a quantity which may not be known. So many practitioners, they would typically put it, if it's not known, they put the variance to one. That's a pretty common uh, replacement. So that means that epsilon is a stochastic variable. It's a random variable. F of x may be a continuous, is a continuous function, but we haven't specified whether we want to treat it as a deterministic object or as a stochastic object. Now, what we have done is then to replace this f of x with a model. So in our case, we have a model which is given by this design matrix times this unknown quantity beta, which then defines our parameters. <coughs> so everything is translated in terms of vectors and matrices. So this is a matrix and a vector of length n, x, is typically a matrix of dimensionality n times p. So there's an important thing here, which I want you to remember, because sometimes when you go into textbooks, they will define this design matrix so that the rows indicate the features which you have and the columns, the data inputs which you have. In my case, I'm going to use the rows to indicate the number of data points I have and the columns to indicate the features. So just keep this in mind because in some textbooks, you will see expressions which I have the transpose of a matrix on without the transpose. So just keep that in mind. That becomes important a little bit when we are calculating quantities like the covariance later today. Then, the uh, vector uh, beta, which contains the unknown parameters, is now a vector of length p. Sorry. And then the optimal parameters, when we took the derivatives, is now given by this matrix, which we have to invert x minus 1 times x transpose multiplied with y. So this is the expression which we have for the unknown parameter beta when we optimize the mean squared error. So we optimize the mean squared error and we typically call this for a cost function, C beta. And we have defined it as one over N and is a sum over all the data entries which we have. And this is given by a Y of I minus the model Y tilde squared. And I just remind you that this y of i tilde is now given, so this is the model, so it will have a sum over j equals 0 to p minus 1. It contains the row number i multiplied with a column with a specific feature times beta j. And we use a compact notation which went like this, x, and then we had an asterisk to indicate that we are multiplying out the uh, columns of the specific vector beta. So this is a more, the, with the asterisk, is a more compact notation which we opted for. So when we took the derivative of uh, the quantity, so let me just, so this is just a reminder of what we derived last week. C beta, we took the derivative and we wanted, this is the optimization problem. And now, uh, one thing I want to remind you of is actually where you find uh, the information about derivatives of matrices and vectors, because this is something which often is uh, not uh, presented uh, in depth in a mathematics course. So I just wanted to uh, remind you quickly of where you can find 
uh, these uh, nodes. So let me bring you back to the uh, basic GitHub site of the course. So let's just bring this one up here. So what we have, if you go to this folder called doc here, and you go into the handwritten notes, and this is connected with exercise five this week, so it's called notes exercise five. And in these notes, what you will find is some kind of additional information about how you calculate derivatives of vectors and matrices. And the thing which is perhaps the most important for us is actually if we scroll down. So remember now that the, we are calculating uh, the mean squared error. So the mean squared error, is that a vector or is it a scalar or is it a matrix? Any good suggestions? Yeah? yeah it's, a it's a scalar, right? So the, um, the mean squared error is just a number, right? So you, ideally you want this number to be zero if you have a perfect model. So the mean squared error, which is given by an expression if we just scroll down a little bit on these uh, notes here, so you will find the, the basic derivations here and how, why you actually end up with the kind of equations which we have. Uh, so I invite you to take a look because it's, a, it's an aid to exercise number five. So the mean squared error looks like this. What we, this is where we started. And it's a, it's a scalar, so what, that's why I put this equal to alpha. So we are taking the derivative of a scalar which is written in terms of matrices times vectors. And we are taking the derivative with respect to this vector x. We've also made an important assumption here. Uh, when we do ordinary least squares, that there is no dependence in the design matrix on the unknown parameters beta. So that means that simplifies the calculation of derivatives. Now, what you will see then is that when you do the calculations here, you're going to get this expression here. So we actually have the transpose of that one in the lecture notes, but it's the same expression, whether you present it as a transpose or not, because it's the quantity beta we are looking after or the derivative with respect to that. So what we get is something which looks like this, and this is what we want to put to zero. And when we do that, we get this expression for the optimal parameters beta. But there is another quantity which is very interesting for us. And this is the quantity which we label as the Hessian matrix. So this is the second derivative. And that matrix, if it is invertible, this A transpose times A, then if it's invertible and positive definite, this will always represent a convex minimization problem which has a global minimum. So that's extremely useful for us when we are minimizing the cost function which we have chosen. So take a look at these notes, and now I'm just going to go back to the, uh, to the, uh, to the slides, not to the whiteboard, sorry for that. So what we uh, ended up with is then a quantity which is given by this quantity x of t times y minus x times beta, and we want that one to be equal to zero. And that gives us this expression which we have set up here. So again, with the linear regression and ordinary least squares, we have analytical answers for the optimal parameters. Now, what comes next now is the calculation of the second derivative. So if we take the second derivative, we actually need to take the derivative of the quantity d because we want to have a scalar, so d beta. And you can show that this one is going to be equal, in our case, to 2 over n times x transpose times x. So if you do the exercises, exercise 5 this week, and you look at that uh, note which you have uh, at the GitHub address, you will see that this is the derivative, the second derivative. So if this matrix is invertible, if it's a positive definite, this leads to a global minimization problem with a global minimum. So the, uh, this matrix uh, is a matrix which in the literature is called actually the Hessian. 
H and it's given in this specific case. This is the specific case which we have here. And I'm coming back to this uh, because this has actually in linear regression, it has many, many interesting connections which uh, are linked up with a statistical analysis of the data. So what I'm gonna do now is actually go back a little bit to what we did yesterday with statistics, because uh, I feel myself that this is something which gives you guys a slightly deeper insight about these methods. Because the kind of statistical analysis is something which has always been there, going to be there on the over the surface of the water. So the uh, having this kind of understanding uh, may sound like, eh, why should I do that? Why don't I just run the, the, the algorithms? But my hope is that you will obviously appreciate these small, tiny mathematical details and that they aid, can aid you in getting a little bit deeper insight about the methods themselves. Because when we get to neural networks, you're gonna have zillions of parameters and then it's very easy to not be able to see the wood for the trees. Because then you just end up with an optimization pr problem with a multi-dimensional object. Whereas in linear regression, we can actually nail down uh, in a very easy way with analytical expressions, the statistical meaning of what we are doing. It's easy to get lost when you do convolution neural network and neural networks and so on. So let me try to baby step you through some of these quantities. So one of the things which we mentioned yesterday was actually about the expectation values. So we brought back some definitions from statistics. And one of the things which I just gave you was the assumption that the output Y is distributed according to a Gaussian with a specific mean value and a variance which is the same as the added noise. So let's see that this is actually the case. And then we are going to find that the variance of the unknown parameters beta is given by that matrix there. When we are going to calculate the covariance matrix, which we mentioned yesterday, and which we are going to need in our analysis, you will see that the covariance matrix is going to be given by that matrix with ordinary least squares. So ordinary least, so ordinary least squares has many nice analytical features which can help in gaining this kind of deeper insight. So let me see if I'm able to convince you about that. I may fail. So please stop me if you have questions, if things aren't clear. So let's go back. This was a kind of repetition of what we put up. So let's go back to statistics and probabilities and expectation values. So one of the things which we didn't calculate yesterday, but which I just stated, was the expectation value of the quantity Y. Now, we do not know the probability. So what we are going to calculate is the mean value of the sample of data which we have. So somebody gives you an output and you may have a thousand data points. And that means that the way you calculate the mean value in this specific case is actually by just calculating the mean value of the sample. So this is gonna be one over N and then you would have a sum over i equals zero to n minus one multiplied with y of i. So let's take a look at the specific parameter y of i. So in our case, y of i is given by the model which we've chosen. So we have the j equals zero up to the number of features minus one we have the matrix elements of the design matrix multiplied with beta j, and then we have this random noise here. And remember that this random noise is now distributed according to a normal distribution with mean value zero and a variance sigma. So when I'm going to calculate uh, the expected values now, the thing now is that this quantity here is a quantity which we just wrote out as x star, xi star times beta. These are assumed to be 
not stochastic variables. And going back to what we mentioned last week, you could think of you running an experiment where you fix all the inputs and you fix the inputs so that they are to uh, such a precision that there is no error. And the fixed inputs are then thought of something which is not a stochastic variable. Then when we are calculating the expectation values here, what we end up with, if we now look at this specific E of Y, this is now going to be the expected value of this quantity xi times beta plus the expected value of this quantity epsilon of i, the mean value of that quantity. Now, not being a stochastic variable means that this is just like a constant multiplied with something, right? So if you're calculating a mean value of a, a quantity which is not a stochastic variable, this is just the, the value itself. So this quantity which you see here, the first one, is actually given by this xi times beta. But then we know that this one is zero by definition. So it means that the mean value of uh, y is now given by this uh, design matrix multiplied with beta. So we can rewrite it in terms of a vector. So it means that E, the expected value of Y is simply X times beta. Now, what we could do next now is to find the variance for this quantity here. So let's look at the variance. So let's pick just one of these quantities. So we want the variance of Y of I. And this is going to be the expectation value of y of i minus the mean value, which we found now. So the expected value of that one, e of y squared. So that's the definition of the variance. And keep in mind that we are dealing with the sample variance. So if I just write this out, and you've probably seen this when you took a course in statistics, or you've probably seen it in other connections. This is given by y of i squared minus the mean value squared. So what we need to do now is just to plug in the value y of i squared. So if we take, we have this value. So this is simply going to be this quantity, which we call xi times beta squared. But now we need this quantity here. So what I'm going to plug in is obviously the definition, which is given by xi times beta plus this epsilon of i. And I'm going to square that quantity and calculate the expectation value. So if I do these operations here, uh, just squaring. Uh, what I'm going to get then is an x of i, and then this star, this odd notation, which you will find in actually in many textbooks. Then I get plus 2 times epsilon of i of x i multiplied with beta plus the expected value of this epsilon i squared. Now, uh, the first term since this is not a stochastic variable, this gives us simply xi times beta squared. And that is going to cancel the term which you see here. Then what I have in addition is plus, and now I have, this is a constant, so I have 2x of i times beta. And then I have the expectation value of epsilon i plus the expectation value of epsilon i squared. And then I have minus this xi times beta squared. Now the expectation value of the mean value of epsilon i 
is by definition set to zero. So that clearly is zero, the, uh, the middle term there. Then you see that uh, this term, which you have the first term, this term here cancels this term. This term is equal to zero. And this term here is actually the variance of this random noise. So what we get then is that the variance of uh, y of i is actually the same as this sigma squared of epsilon. So that's the variance which we've chosen for the, for the noise of the model. Now, since x, the design matrix, is not a stochastic variable, we assume that the distribution of the noise is given by a normal distribution. This allows us to infer that y follows a normal distribution and it has a mean value which is given by the matrix x times beta and a variance which is given by the same variance as the added noise. So this is what allowed us yesterday to assume this probability p of y i given an x and a beta is proportional to a noise given by a normal distribution with mean value x of i beta and variance the same as the one we had for the added noise. So this is a very useful uh, property because that yesterday, when we think back to what we discussed about statistics with Bayes theorem, this allows us to uh, derive the same equations which we did with linear algebra by using the maximum likelihood estimator. So what we use this one was actually to make a final distribution for y given x and beta, which was then given by the product of all, so we, call, we actually call this a p of i. So we had a product. This is a product sign. I hope it's uh, readable, this pi, uh, this sign here, and then multiply with p of i. And when we optimized that one, we got the parameters beta, which are also called the estimators, and this leads to the maximum likelihood estimation. We took the log of this quantity because it's much easier to take the derivative of a log. And then when we took the derivative, we got the same expressions which we got when we did plain linear algebra. So it means that we, when we took the derivative of this quantity with respect to beta, we ended up with the same expression which we had up here. This expression which you'll see here. And from that one, we got the optimal parameters beta. So this is the kind of links with statistics, but I wanted to give you an additional small link here. So let's take a closer look at another quantity. And one of these quantities is a quantity which you are going to get as an exercise next week. But let's look at the expected value of the parameter beta. So beta is also something which we can calculate analytically with ordinary least squares, but also with ridge regression, we can calculate an analytic expression here. Now, if we look at that one, so now I'm going to put a hat here because I want the mean value of the optimal parameters beta. So let's look at, let's look what that actually could be. <coughs> so this means that we need to calculate the expectation value of this matrix xt of x, so this is a non-stochastic object of x of t times y. So this is a quantity we need to look at. And now uh, what we can use is all the kind of wisdom which we have from before. So we know that this one has to be equal to x of t times x. These are non-stochastic variables x of t times the expected value of y. And we already found that one, that expected value, this quantity here, is just x times beta, right? 
So that means that when I now look at the matrices I have, and if we assume that the matrix X transpose times X is invertible, it means that we have the inverse times the matrix itself. So this should actually just be equal to beta because the, the first term here, this term multiplied with this one and multiplied with that should just give us the identity matrix. And that means that in statistics, this means that the parameter is uh, equal to itself and we say the estimator is unbiased. So in statistics, you will find this as an unbiased estimator or parameter. I switch normally between parameters of the model, estimators and so on. So I hope you can see from the context that is actually the same quantity. Okay, so in exercise next week, there's a paper and pencil exercise next week as well. So I'm going to leave that as a small challenge. So I do the, I do the easy stuff in the lectures and I give the rough stuff to you guys. I'll just joke. But you, you can, uh, the thing, this is actually very useful to calculate. Next week, exercise in week 36 is to calculate the variance of the parameter beta. And what you need to do then is actually to set up the uh, definition of beta and subtract the mean value. And you have the mean value, which is given by beta here. So the mean value is already there. So with the mean value, you can calculate the variance. And what you're going to see then is that this quantity has an analytical expression. And it's given by this matrix inverted. So this is the sigma epsilon. So this matrix, which we call the Hessian, uh, which is the second derivative, is also a matrix which gives us an analytical expression for the variance of the parameters beta. Now, what can you do if you have the, so this depends a little bit on the question here, I mean, hinges a little bit on you having done some statistics. If you have the variance of the parameters beta, what can you do then? What can you use a variance to define? Yeah? Could you say that again? The variance of the thickness Yeah. So that gives you the standard deviation, right? So for those of you online, I mean, when you calculate the variance, you know that you have a quantity which is the standard deviation. And now we are just going to define the standard deviation or the standard error, dev, deviation, deviation. That's the square root of the variance. And I'm just gonna label this as a delta beta here. So what we are going to get with the hat here, what we will be getting then is a beta optimal parameter with a plus minus delta beta. So when we then plug this back into the model for Y, then we have a model which gives us a range of errors for our predictions. So remember now that the model gives us the uh, prediction and what we can add to this prediction is actually an error estimate. And this is invaluable. And as I mentioned in the very first lecture, you'll be surprised to see how many calculations there are out there which do not provide errors or error estimates in your model. So this is a case where we actually have analytical expressions. So in project number one, you're going to play around with the variance of the ordinary least squares and then link that with a prediction you make with the model. So you will also see that if the prediction is pretty bad, then the error is going to be pretty large in the parameters beta. Okay, so uh, this was a link number two. So I'm just going to highlight this. So you see now this matrix pops up everywhere. Now, this matrix pops up the way it does in linear regression for this specific case. And 
in, in our case, we also have another relation here, which re gives us the second derivative. So the matrix pops up again here. But now we're going to meet it a third time. And this third time is independent of linear regression. So these two results, which you see here, they pertain to us having used the mean squared error as a model for the uh, for us being able to gauge the quality of the model so remember now that mean squared error is not something magic it's actually a way we use to assess the quality of the model which we make that could be a polynomial fit it could be a more complicated fit so what we are going to do now is to see another interesting link which we are going to use several times in this course so I'm going to abuse a little bit of mathematics in this lecture. And I wanted to introduce the covariance matrix, which we uh, mentioned yesterday, but we didn't define it. OK, so let's uh, bring up that quantity, because this quantity is also a quantity which we will meet again in studies of correlations in the data, but also when we are going to use a method which is called principal component analysis. This is something you will meet in November, October, November. And principal component analysis is based on you diagonalizing this correlation matrix. And you're going to keep the largest eigenvalues because the largest eigenvalues are inversely proportional with the variance. So largest eigenvalues means smallest variance, smallest deviation. And then you're going to use that diagonalization to reduce the number of degrees of freedom. So if you have thousand features, you diagonalize your correlation matrix and you find that there are all, all, only five eigenvalues which are large. Then you keep these five eigenvalues as five features. And then you make a fit of your model with only five properties of five features and this is the basic essence of a method called principal component analysis which people use again and again in as a way to reduce the dimensionality of the problem because remember now that the cases we've been looking at are somehow vanilla cases when it comes to the number of degrees of freedom or the number of features in many many uh, data sets you will have zillions of features and then you are not able to see the wood for the trees again. And principal component analysis is a way to actually, uh, in an unsupervised, supervised way, to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. So let's now look at, from a technical point of view, this quantity, which is called the correlation matrix and the covariance matrix. So let's now meet the covariance. and the correlation matrix. So let me find my cheat sheet here. Okay, so what we did yesterday was to look at, uh, let's say, two data sets. So let's define two vectors. And these need not to be the inputs or the outputs. So this could just be two general vectors. And they contain some data. Define two vectors, which we call x and y. And they are both of the same length. So x and y they are vectors of length n. So what we did yesterday was to define the covariance between X and Y. So the covariance as a, the sample covariance, because we don't have the probability distribution. So keep in mind that everything we are doing now is actually the sample object. This is formally defined as one over N, the number of data points we have and then a sum i equals zero up to n minus one. And we have an x of i minus 
And you may remember yesterday that I defined the sample mean with a bar on top. So the sample mean does not need to be the true mean because we do not have the probability distribution. We may not even have any idea what it looks like. So we may hope it looks like a Gaussian or something simple. But in general, we don't have the exact mean because we don't know the distribution. And that means that what we are stuck with is to calculate the sample mean value. So I will normally distinguish between the true mean value, if you have the probability distribution, with the sample mean value. And this is multiplied with this y of i minus mu of y, like this. Now, one thing which we mentioned uh, during the exercise sessions is that you often scale the data. So the scaling the data means that you subtract the mean. So that means that you could actually have a scale data and then you would get an x of i tilde where you have subtracted the mean value. So remember that one of the things which we will be discussing next week, so I'm just trying to keep you guys in a kind of suspended state so that you can't wait till next week, so next week, we are going to look closer at the scaling of uh, the data. And one typical thing is actually to subtract the mean value. And that gives a, uh, uh, a slightly more compact definition. So let's, let's do that, uh, because then we would have a, we could define an xi tilde and a yi tilde. So this is not the same as the y for the model which we had. So this would simply be 1 over n of i equals 0, n minus 1, and then we have xi tilde, yi tilde. So this is the covariance. Now, since you have two vectors, if we are translating this into a matrix, this becomes a matrix which has dimensionality 2 times 2. So because in every case, so when we now define the uh, the covariance matrix, we will have components xx, xy, and yy. So let's now look at another definition, just to remind you of that one. So we take the variance of one of these quantities, and that is simply 1 over n, and it's now going to be given by y of n minus 1 of this x of y tilde quantity squared. So this allows us to define the covariance matrix. And this matrix is something which I'm going to call C, in our case with X and Y. And the matrix will be given by the covariance of X with itself, which is the variance. And then this quantity is going to be symmetric. So x and y is going to be the same as the covariance of y and x. And then I have the covariance of y with y. So the, uh, the covariance, and since this is a sum of a huge data set, it can lead to huge values. You can rewrite this one. There's a way to scale it. So we can rewrite this one as a variance of x. And here we have the covariance, so the cross terms are x and y. And here we have, and this is symmetric, which you can easily see. And this is the variance of y. So it's common to divide this quantity with a variance, and then you will have one along the diagonals and then it's called the correlation matrix. That was the quantity which we saw yesterday when we analyzed those housing data. So it's uh, one past the hour. Uh, so let's now take a small break, and then we are going to continue a little bit definitions, and you're going to see that this covariance matrix is actually given by the design matrix transposed times the design matrix. So that's a very useful and interesting feature again. But let's take a small break here. Uh, questions, feel free to ask questions.
Uh, I'm going to put the recording on pause now for those of you online here as well. So I got some questions during the break, which I think uh, could be useful to repeat to everybody here. So if we go back uh, to the uh, description which I made here, which is linked up with one of the exercises, the uh, beta here, the variance, is set up as a vector. Uh, this is often something you will see as a kind of uh, annoying thing when you read many textbooks on statistical data analysis. Sometimes it's difficult to see what is a vector or a scalar. And then you have to figure that out from the context. But this beta, uh, the individual variable beta j, is actually given as a variance, which is given by the uh, diagonal matrix elements of the matrix x transpose times x. So I wrote it like a vector here. So that means that when you make a fit, to let's say a quadratic function, you will have a beta zero, which will be the diagonal element of this matrix, zero, zero. And then you will get a similar variance for beta one and beta two, if you do a quadratic fit, because then you have three parameters. That means that you will have beta zero plus minus delta beta zero. And then you will have beta one plus minus delta beta one and the similar for beta two. That means, uh, just as a small digression here, so let me just draw that one before we move on. Suppose now you're making a fit to some data which are given by these circles, and then your fit goes something like this. Now then, when you add, so, and you're now fitting a uh, linear func uh, quadratic function. So you would have a beta zero plus delta beta zero plus beta one plus minus delta beta one times x. If this is x on the axis here, and this is a function y we are fitting, plus some beta two plus minus delta beta two times x squared. So what you will get then when you plug in these numbers is that you are going to get a band which looks like this so this will be the the minimum and then the maximum and this band is the one which is your prediction because then you will actually provide a potential user of your fit with a band which indicates how good the model is so just plotting the straight line is, can sometimes be deceiving because you may even assume then that the reader may even assume there is no error in your model. So the nice thing when you do a statistical data analysis like this with linear regression is that we do have analytical expression for these quantities. Another question which I uh, actually forgot to mention during the, the, uh, the lecture here, actually this covariance, this specific uh, object which I have here is a scalar. Then I'm setting up a covariance matrix. So every entry here is a scalar. So what I'm going to do now is actually to set up the uh, design matrix and look at how we can define the covariance for the design matrix. So uh, in our case now, if we now look at the design matrix, so the design matrix, let's now rewrite it. So in our specific case, what we have is a matrix X. So this is our design matrix. And this matrix X is given by the different components. So we would have an X zero zero, we have an X zero one, and this goes up all the way to the number of features which we have minus one. And then we have an X one zero, x2, 0, and down to x, n minus 1, 0. And then we would have an x, n minus 1, or p minus 1 here. So that would be the, uh, the design matrix, which we have set up. Now, the next thing which we would, can do now is to rewrite this in terms of vectors. So that means that we would take every column 
here and we will define a vector so we can and you've probably seen that when you took a linear algebra course that this x is something which we now could define as a vector and we would have an x zero vector i'm just going to put a kind of a, a bolted symbol here it's going to be an x1 and this is going to go up to an x of p minus one and each one of these like an x zero here this quantity is now given by these components x zero zero x one zero and down to x n minus one zero so that would be a typical component of this design matrix so that's just a more compact way of setting it up that means that i can now define the covariance matrix for the design matrix so what i could do now is simply to set up this quantity which i'm going to define instead of in this specific case i had x and y so i just have a two by two matrix because i have two vectors now in my case now i have a p vectors the number of features so every column represents a feature so that means that when i set up x here i'm actually going to have i'm going to write this as the covariance matrix for the design matrix and it means then that if i follow the definition this is just going to be given by the variance of this vector x zero <coughs> and then along the diagonal I will just have all these variances and this goes down to the variance of xp minus one now along the non-diagonals i would then have a covariance and here we'll have x vector x zero with x one and then we are going to end with a covariance of x zero and i'm squeezing this in a little bit here sorry for the bad judgment when it comes to setting up the size of the matrices covariance and in this case i'm going to have the covariance of my x p minus one but these matrices are symmetric so i'm just going to just write it x zero and x p minus one and so on now just a quick question and see if you uh, can spool back to what we did yesterday if these are identically distributed and independent variables what would you expect for a value of the covariances yeah zero so if the covariance is zero that means that you can think of these parameters as independent and identically distributed so the drawback with the covariance as you've seen it's a sum so as a sum you can have large values and that means that this can become a, a quantity which can have values which can go from let's say minus a million to 10 millions so it's normal to scale the covariance and you scale it by dividing by the variance and that gives the correlation matrix so if you then divide by what's normally called the uh, the, uh, the 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 variance so what you could do now if you look at one of these entries so you could now define this correlation and now i'm just taking this is again a scalar so if i take these vectors x and y that will be defined as the covariance between x and y as we defined it before the break and then this is divided by the variance of x multiplied by the variance of y so i can do the same thing with the covariance of uh, the uh, design matrix which we have and define the correlation matrix so i'm just going to define the correlation matrix now and this is the quantity which people often study and that was a quantity which we looked at yesterday during the lecture and this is normally written in terms of k just for correlation 
And then we, since we only have the vectors X here in the design matrix, I'm indicating that this is the correlation matrix for the design matrix. And then this will simply be given by one along the diagonals. Since I'm dividing, I'm scaling with the variance. This is a way actually to avoid huge values in your matrix. And then since we define this correlation uh, variable, so this would be a correlation called x0 with x1. And this would go all the way up to the correlation of x0 and xp minus 1. And then down here, you would have correlation. And since this is also symmetric of xp minus 1 here. Now, these uh, quantities, the correlation uh, values, they take values between minus 1 and plus 1. So if it's equal to 1, that means that something or absolute value is close to 1. This means that these variables are strongly correlated. If you uh, uh, have a value which is close to 0, it means that there's basically no correlation between these two variables. And you can use that, as I said yesterday, as a quick way to reduce the dimensionality of the problem by just calculating the correlations in your data set among the features which you have. Okay, so uh, one of the things which we are going to discuss a little bit later is, is the connection between this uh, matrix and the, uh, actually the, uh, when, because we are going to see that this matrix is going to be proportional with x transpose times x. But we are going to bring that up a little bit later. But this quantity which you see now uh, is defined uh, as, you can actually rewrite this in a more compact way, as x transpose times, no, x times x transpose. And this is a useful property which we are going to see again and again in this course here. Now, what I wanted to uh, move into now is the next topic, which is called ridge regression. And I'm going to take a kind of historical path first, and I'm going to start with the cheating way of looking at it, which means that when you have a matrix which is non-invertible, or you fear that the determinant is close to zero, you can just add a term along the diagonal, and that will fix the problems for you. And that was actually what was done. Now, what you are going to see is that we can uh, rework this problem here in terms of a nice statistical analysis, but also nice mathematical analysis, where we are going to optimize a function which has actually a slightly deeper mathematical meaning than just adding this simple uh, term along the diagonal. But let's now define uh, what is called ridge regression, because this is the next method we are going to need. And we are going to take this kind of uh, uh, cheating way. So let's move on, ridge regression. So the problem which we face is the problem of having uh, this matrix xt times x. This can be non-invertible. There may be uh, complicated linear dependencies. And that means that this is a straightforward uh, matrix inversion, which we have in ordinary least squares, is actually not possible to do. So one of the things which people actually did was to add a small number lambda to the diagonal matrix elements. Just to give you a small example, and which you can actually practice a little bit if you want to. So there is a there is a matrix, a square matrix. So if you uh, if you take this square matrix, which we have here, this is your matrix now. A. Let me just put this one 
below the line here so that when we save it, we will see it. So let's say we have a matrix which looks like one, minus one, one, minus one here. So what is the determinant of this matrix? Can you see that immediately? This is a square matrix. And normally people would say that the square matrix is a matrix you can find. You need to have a square matrix to find the eigenvalues. So what is the determinant of that matrix? Zero, right? So you probably get used to this now. When I ask these kind of questions with this kind of tone, I'm always looking after the roundest number you can think of. So this has a determinant which is equal to zero. But clearly, if our x transpose times x is equal to that matrix, we cannot perform the inversion. Now, do a small exercise uh, and just try it out. And just try to add one plus a lambda minus one, one and minus one plus a lambda. And see then if you can find a determinant which is non-zero. You will see then that the determinant is non-zero. And what many people did was actually to add just a small, small number. And then you could invert the matrix. It's, it's a kind of cheat, actually. So then that A is no longer equal to zero. Now, what that leads to, uh, from a practitioner point of view, is actually the a matrix which you can deal with. And then you could use just a standard matrix inversion algorithm. However, what this led to later is actually a deeper mathematical analysis and the introduction of something which we call regularization terms. So let me just try to give you the general expression and then we are going to look at uh, what this means uh, from a mathematical point of view, but we're also going to link that with a statistical analysis because that's going to change a little bit the way we are thinking about the distributions of the parameters beta. So we are just going to try to follow like we did with ordinary squares. We are going to try to follow a, both the standard linear algebra way of thinking. And at the same time, we want to link this with a statistical interpretation. But let's now set up the cost function in rich regression. So C of beta. And I'm going to uh, uh, define again the standard mean squared error. So one, and then we have a sum over i equal zero up to n minus one. And then we have y of i minus y of i tilde squared. So that's the standard uh, ordinary least squares. And I'm going to put up a subscript OLS for ordinary least squares. Then we're going to have uh, the uh, ridge regression term and do beta, and that's going to contain the same function, i equals zero to n minus one of y of i minus y of i tilde squared. But then we have something which is called a regularization term, and that introduces a new free parameter. So we would then have something which goes like plus lambda, and lambda is a parameter. And then I have a sum over j equals zero up to the number of features which I have and beta j squared. So lambda is called a hyperparameter. So that becomes an additional parameter. <laughs> the beta j is called a regularization term. And normally lambda is constrained to a value, so it's normally larger than zero. And it's constrained to some maximum value. Because you don't want this to blow up. Because if it blows up, it will just dominate the whole contribution. And what you're going to see then is that your results are going to look pretty strange. Because then this term will dominate over the mean squared error. And when you calculate the mean squared error plus a parameter beta, so if, beta, if this lambda is very, very large, then 
that will actually dominate your cost function. And your cost function will just reach a plateau where you have a constant value, which is dominated by this variable lambda. So this term, which you see here now, is called also in the literature, this term here, is called a regularization term. Uh, you're going to see this written in a more compact way. And many of you are probably familiar with these norms. So you have something which is called an L2 norm. So let me just remind you of the definitions of these terms. So if I have a vector V, I normally put a subscript 2 on it. And often in textbooks, if you don't see the subscript, it normally means an L2 norm. So this would be a sum over all your components, i equals zero up to n minus one, and this is v of i squared. And then you take the square root of this quantity. So that means that you can rewrite many of these quantities. If you now look at the mean squared error, that's also a quantity which you could rewrite in terms of uh, an L2 norm. So let's rewrite these quantities in a more compact way because you will encounter many of these definitions in textbooks. So let's uh, do that again. And then we take this ridge expression. So this C beta ridge, no, not C ridge beta. Then what we're going to have is that we can rewrite this as one over n, and then we have the L2 norm squared of y minus y tilde. And we normally indicate that the L2 norm is squared with writing it like this. So this is a squared L2 norm. So this is the standard mean squared error. You will also see this in a slightly different way. I'm gonna put that one up here. And then I have lambda times this parameter beta, the estimators squared, the L2 norm squared. You will often also see the mean squared error because this is now written as an expectation value over the sample of data. So you would typically see that one as a y minus y tilde squared like this. This is another way because when I have this one over n, that means that I'm running over the whole sample and I divide with a number of entries. And this is, as long as we deal with sample expectation values, this is normally called an expectation value when you don't deal with a probability distribution, okay? This is another way you will see these things. Now, I'm also gonna put up another expression because you are not limited to look at an L2 norm. You could take other types of norms. And there's another one which is widely used and that's called the L1 norm. So let me just bring that up for you. So an L1 norm, no, I can't write anymore, norm. This is a quantity where we now would have the sum of j equals zero. And in our case, we're dealing with this vector beta, but you have the absolute value of beta. <coughs> and you would often see this one written out as a beta, and then simply with a one here. That's the kind of notation which you will encounter in textbooks. So you're not limited to actually use that type of norm here or regularization. So that means that we can define another type of method, which is called LASSO. And I'm going to give you the acronym a little bit later, what it actually stands for. I always forget it, so I always have to look it up. But the, this would now contain the mean squared error. So I would have one over n, and now I'm going to use this notation, which I introduced, y minus y tilde, this norm squared, plus lambda, 
multiplied with the norm one over the vector beta. And then we are going to optimize. So what we want now is to optimize these uh, functions, which we are now using to gauge the quality of the model. Now, what we are going to have is an additional parameter, which gives us quite some freedom in fitting our model. And you will see typically that when you have data with strong dependencies in the columns of the feature matrix, that actually this parameter lambda can give you a better fit. We can actually show that the variance uh, or the mean squared error can be reduced by proper choices of lambda. It's not always the case. If you have a simple polynomial fit, as you will see in project number one, ordinary least squares is going to rule the ground. But when you come to more complicated data sets, uh, tuning this parameter lambda can actually lead to a better mean squared error. And you're going to practice this in different applications. And we are going to look later and try to understand why uh, these parameters uh, become uh, useful in the analysis. Now, what we will do next is now to optimize. So if we go back and take the cost function for reach and do a D beta. So that means that we are going to get the same thing which we had for ordinary least squares. So the mean squared error, that's the first term, that is going to be the same. So we're going to get a minus two divided by N and then I'm going to have my matrix X of T times Y minus X times beta. But since I'm now having this equation here with a, a lambda multiplied with the parameter beta, what I'm going to get then is actually something which goes like plus two times lambda times the vector beta. <coughs> So what's often common then when you do ridge regression and lasso regression is that we tend to skip the one over n because that's going to simplify the mathematics here. So I, I mentioned to you in the beginning that you are free to define the cost function as you want. So some people actually take, instead of the mean squared error, they take one divided by two because then you get rid of the two when you take the derivative. Uh, I've defined it as the... Uh, as the expectation value of the sample. Uh, if we take away this one over n, so this is pretty common to do that. So that means that we would, uh, instead of having uh, the one which I defined, we could now just get rid of n. You see now that we have a term two, which uh, uh, stays in both cases, and we could just divide it away, right? And we want this quantity here to be equal to zero. So if we reshuffle a little bit this equation here and take away the one of n just to start with another function, we have to be careful, however, when we are going to implement the gradients numerically, because when we do that, we need this one of n. But when we are setting up the equations now, it's pretty standard to actually avoid the n dependence. You can always multiply it in back because then uh, just think of this n as a parameter which you would multiply away and then you would actually bake that n into the parameter lambda, right? And that means that you would have a lambda tilde which you then relabel as lambda. So just think of this n. So in, I'm just doing this now because in some textbooks they skip the one over n. But if you do the mathematics with n, you multiply it away and then you have a lambda times n and you just redefine the parameter lambda. Are you okay with that? So it's just a, a simplification here. You can keep it, but then you just redefine lambda. It, it, it's not gonna change anything. But what happens then is that you're going to get, if we now look at the algebra here, uh, we are going to have a, a x. So I divided away uh, the parameter two here. So we got an x times x times beta plus lambda times beta, which is equal to x t times y. And that means that the parameter beta 
is now the optimal one, the one which minimizes the cost function, is now going to be given by a new matrix. And the matrix which we are going to invert is given by x transpose times x plus a diagonal matrix multiplied with lambda. And then we have to take the inverse of that one and multiply it with x t times y. So this looks pretty much like what we have seen before, right? Except that now we have a matrix which brings us back to this trick where we add just a parameter along the diagonal. But we, the benefit here by doing this is that we have an optimization problem which we can add some interpretation features to which we're going to discuss a little bit later. But now I just wanted to go through the technicalities here. So um, on the other hand, if I do lasso regression, there's gonna be a problem here. So in ridge regression, we get a nice analytical expression for the inverse here and for the parameters beta. When I do lasso regression, I have to take the derivative of an absolute value. And then I have to put in if statements in case the derivative gives me a value which is less than zero or larger than zero. So remember that if you take the derivative of the absolute value of x, that's minus one if x is less than zero, zero if x is zero, and plus one if it's larger than zero. So that means that uh, you're not going to get the same nice analytical expression as you have with ordinary least squares and ridge regression. Now, let's try to move on a little bit with this kind of mathematical analysis. And uh, what we're going to look at uh, is uh, another algorithm, which is called the singular value decomposition. And I, I wanted to say something about this algorithm because uh, we are going to uh, make some interpretation mathematically of what ridge regression and lasso regression actually mean compared with ordinary least squares. So I want to give a kind of overarching picture first. So what you're going to see is that ridge regression and lasso regression, they are going to reduce the importance of less important features. So you can view these methods as ways to get rid of some features which are less relevant. So you probably don't see that immediately, but we need to go through some features of the singular value decomposition in order to rewrite uh, this ridge regression and ordinary least squares. So the essence is that with this parameter lambda, which you have here, you can actually tune away some of the features which often are less important. That's the key overarching message. Next week, we are going to look at this in more detail mathematically, but now I wanted to bring up the SVD, and then I'm going to use slides here. So uh, what we are going to do now is an analysis, but I want to say the key message here. Lambda can be used To, and I'm going to write this because they are called, they also called shrinkage parameters. So you can actually shrink away by tuning this lambda, shrink away less important features. So you can think of this as a kind of dimensionality reduction. Think of these, of lambda as a way to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. You can also, with appropriate values of lambda, you can get a better mean squared error. 
than you get with ordinary least squares. And this applies also to lasso regression. So this kind of hyperparameter allows you really to, if you're lucky, to get a better fit to the data you want to reproduce. And I'm going to try to baby step you in these kind of directions here. But in order to understand this shrinking away, we need to dive into uh, an analysis, a mathematical analysis of this in terms of the singular value decomposition. So let me also uh, mention this. So you can actually, uh, the mean squared error with region lasso regression So regression can be tuned down to produce a lower mean squared error, can be tuned down by a select by appropriate values of uh, lambda values. So these are two important features. Now to understand this, let's now take a look. Let's go back to the slides and uh, take a look at the, uh, the uh, mathematics of the singular value decomposition. So I'm going to take the liberty now of uh, not going through uh, this on, on the whiteboard. So let me just bring this up again here. And then we're going to look at the slides for this week. <clears throat> So let's just take the slides here. No, not this one. I actually wanted to, let's take the plane here. Oops. So as we've seen, uh, the singular value decomposition or the SVD, this is, I mean, to me, it's actually one of the really beautiful algorithms in linear algebra. So can, can you read well in the back there? Can you see everything clearly? So it's actually uh, an algorithm uh, which uh, uh, allows us to circumvent some of these problems with the matrix inversions. However, I'm also going to use this to give you a deeper insight about what lasso regression and ridge regression are doing. So I just gave you the operative expressions for finding the parameters beta, but now we need to dig a little bit deeper in order to understand this kind of uh, shrinkage of less important features. So uh, it is a, uh, in machine learning, it actually plays a central role in dealing with the uh, design matrices that may be near singular or, or singular. And also what we are gonna see is that you can relate this analysis to this covariance matrix. So we're actually going to catch many birds with just one stone. And in turn, the variance of a given quantity. You're going to meet this later when we look at the principal value decomposition. So that would be in the end of October, beginning of November. So there are many things which we are going to uh, use in connection with the, the singular value decomposition. So as I said, uh, if you look at the typical problem which you may face, so remember again that the design matrix does not need to be a symmetric matrix. You can have 10,000 rows and 30 columns which represent the features. So, and if you look at the matrix like the one which you have here, this is a matrix which is normally deficient and the columns, as you can see, they're actually linear dependent. And you will have, you will encounter many problems in your data sets where you can have linear dependencies in the columns. And that's gonna wreak havoc when you want to use standard ordinary least squares. Then uh, you will have something uh, like super collinearity and if you look at, for instance, that matrix uh, X, the, uh, the second one, uh, that matrix there is a matrix 
for which you cannot find the eigenvalues. And uh, that's simply because the determinant is equal to zero. So it's a singular matrix and the inverse is actually undefined. That's uh, equivalent to saying that the matrix has at least an eigenvalue, which is zero. So let me remind you a little bit of the singular value decomposition, what it actually does. So I mentioned to you that the one way to fix the singularity is this cheap uh, way of doing that, where you introduce a parameter. But then let's now look at the singular value decomposition. So what you would have is that you have a, if you have a square matrix, it normally can be diagonalized and that's called a normal matrix. Uh, you can have square matrices which cannot be diagonalized like the one we saw in the previous case. The matrix, uh, the thing with the uh, uh, singular value decomposition is that you can rewrite the matrix in terms of an orthogonal matrix U, the so-called singular values, which would contain values which are larger than zero, and they are sorted as an ascending series, not descending with the largest eigenvalue first, and then you can have the singular values, they actually call singular values, which are zero. So the uh, uh, properties of these matrices here is that these matrices are orthogonal or unitary. So let me just remind you quickly of that. If you have an orthogonal matrix, it means that X times X transpose is equal to X transpose times X. And if it's unitary, then we have X times its uh, emission conjugate which is given by uh, the emission conjugate times the matrix itself. This means also that the uh, inverse is equal to uh, the transpose of the matrix. That's another important feature. And when we perform these operations, we know that this is equal to the identity matrix. So you can actually rewrite your matrix in terms of, and this matrix X does not need to be a square matrix does not need to be that. In our applications, in most of our applications, in machine learning, it's never gonna be a square matrix, as you've seen, right? So that means that these U and V will have different dimensionalities, but the theorem, which I state now, without proof, is that you can decompose any matrix, really any matrix, and that's the power of the method. And you can actually decompose that in terms of free matrices. So we are going to look at the properties of uh, the thing. Oops, oops, what did I do here? Maybe that was a signal that it's actually the hour now. We're getting close to the end. So uh, next uh, week, next Thursday, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, unfortunately put you to sleep with more mathematics. You've been very patient, but I hope you like this. I mean, I like it. I hope I can contaminate you with uh, this kind of... Uh, feeling for the mathematics of the methods. And this is a little bit the difference between this course and other courses in machine learning, is that we are going to have the hands-on stuff, but at the same time, uh, we want to give you a little bit more than black boxes, so that you have a feeling of what is going on. So next week, we are going to use the first lecture on discussing the singular value decomposition and connection with Ridge and Lasso. And then after that, we are going to look at the statistical connection between Ridge and Lasso and how we can actually interpret it. So just anticipate that interpretation. What we are going to see is that if we assume that the parameters beta follow a normal distribution multiplied with a normal distribution for the outputs y, we will uh, be able to interpret uh, and recover the equations for ridge regression. If we assume that the parameters beta follow a Laplace distribution, we are going to get Lasso regression. So this means that it puts, if you think of Bayes' theorem, it gives us a statistical way of interpreting what these parameters actually mean. So that hopefully gives us a little better feeling of these methods. And then I will try to motivate what it also means from an optimization point of view 
And for those of you who are familiar with the Lagrangian optimization problems, this is actually just an, an example of that. Okay, guys, thanks for the patience. Wishing you the very best for the weekend. Enjoy your days. Take care. Thanks. So for those of you online, if you if you have some questions before I we just stop them, we're gonna stop the recording anyway.